Welcome to episode 8 of Microbrews, my new video series on how to make the best use of a microscope in your home or craft brewery. In this episode, I'll be showing you how to perform cell counts using a hemocytometer. I will also show you how this can be combined with viability staining using Tripan Blue to get a more accurate measure of your true pitch rate. For this video, I am going to assume you know how to use your microscope, perform a serial dilution, and perform a viability stain with Tripan Blue. If you're unfamiliar with serial stains, please watch episode 6. If you do not know how to perform viability staining, please watch episode 7. If you need help using your microscope, please watch the first five episodes of Microbrews. For cell counting, you're going to need a hemocytometer and a cover slip. Now you can buy cheap hemocytometers like this one here, as well as cheap cover slips like this one here, for just a few dollars off of sites like AliExpress. I have compared these to the clinical grade instruments that I have at work, which cost around $400. And the counts that I get off of these inexpensive hemocytometers are within 3% of what I get off of those more uh, specialized clinical units. So for brewery use, these really cheap Chinese-made hemocytometers are more than sufficient. You will likely also need to do serial dilutions to perform accurate counts. So for that, you're going to need uh, some sort of a spot plate or other uh, dish to dilute samples in, as well as a pipetter and some, wa and some water. And if you want to do viability staining, you are also going to need your 0.4% Tripan Blue, as discussed in Microbrews Episode 7. Now, I just want to show you quickly the hemocytometer in its case. Even though this unit is relatively cheap, they've taken some effort to pack this properly. You'll notice the hemocytometer itself is in a plastic storage bag with a foam base to help protect it. And it's really important when you're storing these things that you do keep them in their case with the foam padding and I recommend keeping them in their plastic bag as well. This will just help to protect that glass surface where the counting grid is from being accidentally scratched or damaged. If you don't have a plastic bag like this or a proper case I would recommend wrapping this up in a lint-free cloth, cotton or linen preferred, and then storing it someplace safe. I don't know how well you can see this but I'm trying to show you a close-up of the hemocytometer. So the hemocytometer itself is comprised of a fairly thick glass plate into which is carved this central imaging re region. And essentially what we have here is two elevated platforms and then some recessed areas that have very fine gradations carved into the surface. And you can kind of make them out in the image here as these slightly brighter areas in that central region. Now the cover slip itself will sit across the top of this region on, resting on those two side supports and this creates a gap of a very uh, specific depth between that cover slip and the hemocytometer. And in fact, the only difference between a clinical grade unit and a unit like this is in a clinical grade unit, both the cover slip and the hemocytometer are simply ground to much finer tolerances. For uh, a budget unit like this, they just run it through a basic machine and there is no post measuring to ensure that it conforms to the required depth. But like I said, I've used a number of these and they're all typically within 3% of what you would expect with a uh, clinical grade unit. A hemocytometer works by holding a cover slip a very specific distance from the base of the hemocytometer and inscribed on that base is a grid with very specific dimensions. Because of the accuracy in both the height of the cover slip above the base as well as the accuracy of the printing of the grid on the hemocytometer, we know that when we put liquid in between that cover slip and the base, that we will get a very specific volume fitting as a column above each grid section. Therefore, if we count the number of cells in a known grid area and performing some basic math, we can determine the number of yeast cells in our sample. Most hemocytometers use a standardized grid with a standardized height, but always check the instructions that came with your hemocytometer to make sure that you're using the right calculations. The vast majority of hemocytometers have a one millimeter by one millimeter major grid region, which is 0.1 millimeters deep. This means that 100 nanometers of liquid will fill the area over the one millimeter by one millimeter grid region. The standard hemocytometer can be thought to have two distinct regions. The first region in the middle is a one millimeter by one millimeter area with a high density grid in most cases, this grid is 0.5 by 0.5 millimeters in size. This is ideal for counting denser yeast suspensions, as that higher density grid makes it easier to keep track of which cells you have counted within each grid space. 
The second region is actually four parts of the cover slip. It's the four corners. Each of these corners is one millimeter by one millimeter in size uh, and has a lower density grid, typically 0.25 by 0.25 millimeters. So this is perfect for counting lower density lease solutions, but because you're counting a smaller number of cells, you should count all four corners in order to ensure an accurate count. To load your hemocytometer, place the cover slip onto your hemocytometer, making sure that it's supported by the bridges. Now your hemocytometer actually contains two separate grids, which you load either from the top or from the bottom. So to load one side, what you do is take your yeast sample and just place it right on the edge of that grid between the cover slip and the uh, hemocytometer base and only add enough yeast so that it fills in that area. You don't want to add any extra yeast as that could potentially float your cover slip, raising it up, which would then ruin your count. Now, you don't need to, but I would recommend actually loading both sides of your hemocytometer, even though you're only going to count one side, simply to ensure that that cover slip doesn't move as you're working on your sample. Uh, with only one side loaded, there is a more of a tendency for that cover slip to move. Once your hemocytometer is loaded, place it onto the stage of your microscope, center your microscope over the grid in which you're planning on counting, and then focus on the grid using your lowest magnification lens. It's important you count properly to get an accurate count. Go box by box in a systematic manner through the entire grid. This way you won't miss any of these spaces within the grid. You need to be extra careful when counting on the edges, especially if you're worried about precision. The edges typically will have a double or triple line. So what you want to do is on the left or top sides of that major grid area, count any cells touching any of the lines that demark the edge of the grid. However, on the right side and the bottom of the side, don't count any cell that touches any of the lines on the grid. This ensures you're always counting the exact same region and that the region you're counting is exactly one millimeter by one millimeter in dimension. As a general rule, you want to be picking either the center grid or those four corners based on counting at least 200 cells within that grid area to get an accurate count. Assuming you have a standard hemocytometer, your calculation is fairly easy. For the middle region, your yeast density is equal to the number of yeast cells you counted, multiplied by any dilution you performed, times by 10,000. For example, if you counted 300 yeast from an undiluted sample, you would have 3 million cells per milliliter. If you counted 300 yeast in a solution diluted 1 in 5, you would have 15 million cells per milliliter. For the corner regions, assuming you counted all four corners, you first want to divide your count by four to get the average number of cells per one millimeter by one millimeter grid region. After this, the math is the same as with the center region. Multiply this average count by your dilution factor and then by 10,000 to get your cell count. So if we counted 240 cells across all four corners, we'd have an average of 60 cells per one millimeter by one millimeter region. Assuming the mixture was undiluted, this would be 600,000 cells per mil. To combine cell counting along with viability staining is actually quite simple. Again, you're going to need a drop plate or some other kind of dish for staining. And into one of the wells, place a known number of drops of your yeast sample. To those droplets, add an equal volume of tripan blue. Mix this thoroughly and then load onto your hemocytometer. An important thing to remember when combining tripan blue staining with cell counting is the tripan blue addition dilutes your sample and you need to take that into account with your calculations. So if you've stained an undiluted yeast sample, you need to use a dilution factor of two because you added an equal amount of tripan blue and yeast. If you diluted your yeast sample 10 times before adding the tripan blue, you're now working with a one in 20 dilution. So this is how to perform cell counting with a hemocytometer and how to combine it with viability staining to count only viable cells. Please join me in episode 9 of Microbrews to learn how to use some basic stains to better view the morphology and other characteristics of yeast and bacteria in your brewery.